Oh boy. We do a who was it? Do please take your seats if you could. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for, for um, waiting for this incredibly important uh, Willie Birmingham lecture. Uh, welcome and welcome to our audience who are Zooming in. I'm Professor Roseanne Kenny. I'm Regis Professor of Physic at Trinity College in Dublin, but my hat today, very importantly, is as president of the Irish Gerontological Society. And today we are completing our two and a half day meeting with a prestigious lecture delivered by Professor Sean O'Keefe, which marks Willie Birmingham's contribution to older persons in Ireland. Let me tell you a little bit about Willie Birmingham first of all. Willie Birmingham undertook his ALONE project 
and I expect that everybody in the audience and those online will be very well aware of a loan, particularly since it's wonderful work during COVID. But he undertook in 1977 a project which he entitled A Little Offering Never Ends Alone. An organization which highlighted the plight of old forgotten individuals who were living in squalor in Dublin. He was a fireman and he noted on his call outs with his colleagues from the fire brigade, a number of older persons living in squalor and sad conditions, particularly at the end of life. So he and his colleagues formed a loan and it was a volunteer group and it grew and grew and of course has grown from strength to strength and is the wonderful organization which contributes to so much to Irish society today. He received the People of the Year Award in 1979 and in 1985 was awarded the International Firefighter of the Year Award. In 88, he was awarded an honorary doctorate of law by Trinity College in Dublin. He died in 1990, but of course the foundations that he has laid have ensured that Alone is still an extremely active charity in Ireland. We have an annual lecture and we do it in collaboration and sponsored by Alone to mark this area of champion rights, particularly with respect to the older person. And this year's speaker is Sean O'Keefe, who is a consultant geriatrician and clinical professor in University of Galway. Sean O'Keefe graduated from UCD in 85 and trained in internal and geriatric medicine in Galway, in Dublin, in Boston and Liverpool. He then returned to Ireland as a consultant to St. Michael's and St. Vincent's Hospital in 1996, a true periambulatory geriatrician. His CV doesn't formally say that. Um, he, however, got met and fell in love with and subsequently married a Galway girl, hence his current position in Galway, where he's made huge changes. But his big passion for years has been advocating and lobbying for justice and clarity in this whole area that he's going to speak to today. Um, he is co-chair of the HSE National Consent Policy Revision Group, the HSE Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act Implementation Group, and the HSE DNAR, Do Not Resuscitate, Actively Resuscitate Policy Revision Group. So given his expertise and extraordinary interest in this area, who better to share that with us today than Sean O'Keefe. Gosh. Uh, thank you very much, Roseanne. That sounds daunting. Uh, the title of the talk, I don't know who chose it, it may be me, but I'm going to go light on the ethics. It'll be ethics with a small e in the, the basic idea that ethics is just about doing the right thing or trying to do the right thing. And a lot of times that's about trying to get the balance and the balance between different competing interests. Uh. There we go, sorry. Uh, may I go now? Oh, my activities of daily lecturing are doing very badly here. <laughs> Will it come out the other end, I hope? <laughs> <laughs> Is there? There. How's that? Ah, lads, lads. <laughs> You're all going to leave now. <laughs> There's no reason to do anything. <laughs> it is. It's even better in slow motion, Ken, I'm afraid. <laughs> this is where I'm going to start now. <laughs> 
Oh, here we go again. There. Now, this is actually Sharon Kaufman, is one of the, the pioneers of, of medical anthropology. And this is a statement she made about basically all people being the battleground, and the battleground often for this problem between risk and safety. And that's, that's an old observation, and it's, it's one of the ones that's still enormously relevant, and it's relevant in particular to the forthcoming legislation as to how we negotiate between autonomy and between risk. And we have a, a somewhat difficult relationship with the law and with lawyers. Uh, bastard, 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 knight and bastard, solicitors. Nothing personal, Mr. Knight. I was hoping to speak to one of the others. When you want one yourself, you want someone tough. But instead, we often are entangled in a difficult relationship. And yet we need the law and we need the lawyers. New healthcare legislation, I'm going to talk a bit about it, but not too much. It's coming. And we're traditionally under legislated for in Ireland. It's not that we're, we're swamped in, uh, in legislation. What we do have is this extraordinarily new Assisted Decision Making Act, and it's just commenced. Uh, it's massive in terms of the impact on a lot of professions, not just healthcare, but banking, finances, and for dealing with vulnerable people, whether they're older people, anybody with cognitive impairment or communication disabilities. And they do govern it. And it's come in, and we're, we're learning how to implement it. I won't talk about the NHSS, where we're certainly experiencing challenges because the, the changes are complex and are into the others. But I want to go, first of all, and talk about risk, because I said we're talking about risk and safety. And there's no question we're dealing with older people. You're dealing with a population where the risk of something going wrong is simply very high in some groups. And these are American data, and the first one there is all unintentional. And you see the highest, the blue is for the over, the over 85s, falls, motor accidents, suffocation, poisoning, fire, all incredibly dramatically increased in those age groups. So uh, you may have heard of things like micromorts, how far you can travel before you incur a one the million risk of, uh, risk of injury. And you can travel on the motorbike about six miles on the car about 250 miles, but we're, we're macromort people. We're not dealing with, with small risks, and we may as well acknowledge that. People also see other dangers, and uh, I mean, healthcare professionals and people close to older people as well as themselves. One, for example, particularly when people have cognitive impairments, is that they'll get lost, they'll wander off, something terrible will happen. And it's a common reason for people going into residential care. In fact, it does happen, there's no question. But it's always striking just how enormously kind most people are. That you, particularly, and you see it certainly in rural areas, you're in the community where people know you, they look out for you, you're retrieved, you've mixed up day and night, you've tried to go to mass and it's three in the morning. People bring you back. The, the incidence of serious accident and injury is actually very low. And that's not to downgrade it or say it isn't important, it's just to get the balance right. A lot of fear of crime, and particularly in rural areas. And, and again, the paradox noted here is it's not strangers you need to fear in many cases, it's sometimes those close to you, unfortunately. And again, that older people are less risk of violent crime than younger people. You're much greater risk hanging around Supermax and Air Square than you are in other parts of the, the county. So not to get us too entangled, the other one is risk, and risk in, in economics often means some sort of measurable, quantifiable chance of something happening. But in, in healthcare, risk easily gets mixed up with uncertainty. There's a risk of something adverse happening. Uh, and people worry about the what ifs, what if it happened? And they're very different and shouldn't be conflated. I, I like these two quotes of Bertrand Russell saying that it's natural for us to look for certainty but it is nevertheless a vice, and that we are, uh, we are a science of uncertainty and an art of probability, as Osler put it, and we simply have to learn to negotiate that territory. Oh, God, like the worst in the world. What people say they want certainty in doing things is, you know, you search the crystalline waters and you come up with it. I think of single organ specialists always when I do this. I think you're you're diving in the clear waters, oh look, it's type four renal tubular acidosis, and you've got your diagnostic criterion as clean as anything. And sometimes in life, there are clear answers. It was curiosity killed the cat. 
But, but uh, there is a better side which I seem to have lost on uh, we've good and bad news about your cat, Mr. Schrodinger. <laughs> but anyway, that's a, a different day. But what we do instead, I, I think of us as bog snorkelers compared with the single organ specialists. If you think about it, we end up with incomplete information, both from the community, from people themselves, and communication difficulties. Uh, we end up with trials sometimes that don't reflect our populations and guidelines that work for single conditions and don't work for people with multimorbidity and comorbidities. And there's actually no escaping the fact that we, we have to deal with murky waters. And there's almost no point in being involved in care of older people if you can't deal with that as an issue. We've inherited this whole language about risk and older people, and a lot of it is it may not be intended as such, but it is pejorative and sometimes the meaning. And it means you, you have a safe or even unsafe discharge, you have a safe swallow or a non-safe swallow, and you fail your swallow assessment, or you fail your home visit. Even the vulnerable at risk, and I'd argue even you congratulate somebody on your successful aging, means you better go to the next bed and say, sorry, you've aged very unsuccessfully in this case. <laughs> you, you know, it, it's simply not, not the way we should do it. My particular bugbear, I can't throw it in, this is the great Rosalie Kane, is needs 24-hour care. Where I always say to people, would you just come out and say, should be in a home? Because that's effectively what you're saying. And it's, a, you know, so it's a shorthand and it's dressed up in the kind of... Uh, medical nursing need. You know, there certainly are people who have very substantial care needs, but the idea that you're going to receive all of this enormous care by moving into residential care, which is often the focus of doing it, when you're moving in to be with multiple other people in an environment often relatively poorly staffed, there's a big advantage if you fall in nurse comes, you're going to be found and picked up quicker. But it shouldn't be that you're not going to fall at all. People talk about the acceptable level of risk, and the quote up here is, uh, I don't blame them as a prof profession for being aggrieved, and that's psychiatry. And it's talking in particular about risk of suicide, a particularly horrible topic. But, but Davis, I don't blame him, is saying that people go on about risk assessments and being formed by psychiatry, but they never go and say, well, what's actually an acceptable level of risk? Because th there is no absolute level of risk. And there's a great sense of unfairness that every time there's an untoward event, and this certainly happens in psychiatry, then it begins that, that your assessment in some way was a failure, that you should have been able to predict this and prevent that. And it's, it's a dangerous narrative for professionals. It's also a dangerous narrative for the community, and particularly for older people, in that all the things that could go wrong can potentially be uh, prevented. The paper at the end is... is one summer I couldn't coordinate holidays again with my wife, so they family headed off to Baltimore and in boredom I performed a cross-sectional study of seeking to find out what an acceptable level of risk was. I, and many of you may have contributed, uh, certainly did include the geriatricians, but of doctors, of clinician managers, and as well uh, I got the addresses of public representatives uh, all TDs and about 10% of all councillors. And the response rate was surprisingly good. Very few, a few abusive letters saying, why are you annoying me that way? But the answer was, and it was saying that every time you discharge somebody from the ED, you do so in good faith. And we're not talking about negligence or carelessness, but there's always the chance that something will happen despite your best intentions, despite doing everything, and they will actually deteriorate and something serious, the most serious is obviously death, and that can occur even if you use all the most up-to-date rules and guidance from your professional bodies and pneumonias and falls, etc. And I was trying to say, well, what is an acceptable if by admitting, if you can prevent a death by admitting and all the rest you discharge will be absolutely safe as a result? And it was fascinating to find that the doctors and indeed our clinician managers haven't forgotten their clinical instincts came back at about one in a thousand. So it will happen one in a thousand out of the blue by chance. 999 will have gone home and everything will have worked out as planned. When you look at the managers, we're up to one in 5,000. And look at the politicians, 
up to one in 10,000, and an increasing number saying absolutely no risk of something going wrong after discharge from ED is acceptable. If you think our EDs are overcrowded at the moment, then, and every time you get kind of an email from a manager telling you hurry up and discharge people more quickly, just think about it. They're much more risk averse. We have to live in the real world, and in general do live in the real world. And there needs to be that pushback of saying you can't have it both ways, of saying you want the place empty, you want everybody discharged quickly, but you're actually pushing us to, you know, into the area where, where risk occurs and, and trying to hide and say that that's your job now to do risk assessments and you fail if something happens isn't fair. The one that was interesting was uh, that older doctors were less risk averse than younger doctors. And I'm not sure if that's a generational thing. And there has been a shift, and there could well be that people feel more under threat. Or it may well be, of course, that you simply mature and talk and kill the and you become more accepting of the inevitability. Uh, but what's also clear is that the public, in fact, when you have surveys of different population groups saying what risk they accept, is they're actually very sensible. So people who've lived with conditions are aware that there is no absolute risk-free option and that there is a balance between trying to have some sort of autonomy, safety uh, or independence against absolute risk reduction. So it's a matter of trying to get the narrative right. And it's, it's one of the reasons why of my well-known aversion to risk-feeding policies, etc., uh, where I've always argued you might as well have uh, walking at, a, at acknowledged risk of falling, for example or taking warfarin that acknowledged risk of bleeding. You know, it's simply caked into everything we do. It's not unique to any area. I'm going to go on to that one and say, that is not to say that we don't, by the way, uh, we should put bars in showers, not necessarily the same one as here. You, t you take the sensible measures that need to be taken and you go with them. It just is not to overdo it. Uh, and of course, another example is actually falls risk assessment tools. And this is a, from David Oliver's famous paper, recommended people drop stratify was the one he did of saying it's not good enough. And one of the banes of my life in doing the case for the state claims agency is how many often people tie themselves up in knots by having policies saying it's essential that we do falls risk assessment every week. And I've seen that in institutions of saying, well, actually, what benefit is that going to be for anybody? That's going to provide an awful lot of paperwork which will prevent our overpressed nursing staff from being able to observe people and work with them in that way. So don't get carried away with them. This is today's Humpty Dumpty, who might be more risk averse, even though my favorite Humpty Dumpty cartoon is the one where the doctor is talking to him and says, the cracks can be fixed, Mr. Dumpty. It's your cholesterol I worry about. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk about ADM and how this inter interacts with some of this, because it's, it's a big legislation. The first thing, and the most important slide is this. This is the complicated bit of it, these three new tiers of support. And they're tools, they're optional tools, they're not mandatory interventions. Uh, we had the old wardship system, one big blunt instrument for everything. And the analogy I like is you've been given three new precision tools. And when you get a lovely new toolkit, you read the manual and you put them away somewhere clean and dry. And you take them out when you need them for a special job. What you don't do is take them out and you start drilling random holes in the wall and furniture. Because now you've got a tool and you want to try it out. And we've seen a bit that there are certainly areas where you have to use tools. Uh, but this isn't, uh, this isn't mandatory in some way. You're allowed not to. There are guiding principles, and they're the, the core of it, really, uh, because they're the spirit of the act. It's how you approach people. Uh, and how you approach people is the gist of it. It's not about going to court, even as a last resort, as one. And it's accepting that the, the principles include the presumption of capacity, that that can be rebutted. It's not fixed in stone forever. It may be that you take all reasonable steps to help people to make it. And again, it's this quote that making an unwise decision doesn't mean you can't make a decision. And even if people 
do lack capacity for some reason, even after that, you don't do anything unless you have to. It's not, I have found somebody who lacks decision-making capacity, I must do something. And it has happened a bit in terms of younger doctors coming in. They're like a cat dragging in a mouse and they deposit it at my feet and say, Dr. O'Keefe, I found he lacked decision-making capacity. What do I do now? I said, you should have thought of that first, really, before, before doing it. The, the will and preference is like a tread running through the legislation. And it is, it's not saying everybody gets what they want, but it's saying that actually listening to what people want and in as far as it's practical, giving effect to it. So it's about the spirit of doing it. And even the last one about acting at all times in good faith and for the benefit of the person. Now, we've had a number of problems in getting people to do this. I'm going to, you've all heard of Too Long, Don't Read. And this is the, the HSC guidance. We made it short, it became very short, still didn't read, and should read, probably won't, read a bit, got bored, and skim read, missed the point. <laughs> because even when you talk about unwise decision, the people have said, well, now there's a new right to make unwise decisions, and that's the wrong phrasing. It just says merely because you do something unwise doesn't mean you lack decision-making capacity. The merely is important. It's not a license to ignore people who are having major difficulties in coping, which is entirely different. It's simply getting the, the nuance right in terms of interpretation. The will and preference, for example, doesn't mean you get everything you want. It's within the scope of the available provisions, and we all know that you, you may be in an area, certainly in Galway, where there's very little home health provision. And the reality is that after choices will be between going home into a situation where the supports are going to be suboptimal or choosing an alternative such as residential care. And that's your choice to make. But there's no good demanding that you get a bunch of home helps on inch man when there's none of them there. It just isn't going to work. So it has to be the available options. And then the other one is act at all times in good faith and for the benefit. And what doesn't appear anywhere is the phrase best interests. And the reason, and it may be unfair, is that best interests acquired this baggage. And it acquired the baggage of best interests means medically safe, going along with medical interventions. And in fairness, that was never actually intended with it. So the far the benefit is to try and change the language and get a, a reboot, so to speak. It's taken broadly. It takes into account people's wishes as well. It takes into account the whole generality of who they are, their beliefs and values, what they want, where they're coming from. Uh, so it, it is not simply, as it was often interpreted, and can indeed be misinterpreted in Britain under the, the Medical Capacity Act, which is a very different law, as saying, now we get to decide. It's in your best interest. You do what we tell you. This was a pre-wardship case which received a lot of publicity and it was an important one even though it was decided because it started pre-April uh, it went under wardship but it was the same principle dealt with in an Irish court properly for the first time which was the idea that you can have somebody in this case somebody where the medically recommended treatment was an amputation of the leg to save life and where there was agreement that was, he was unable to weigh up and use all of the options and lack decision-making capacity, but nevertheless, his vehement wish not to lose his leg should take precedence over those, that it wasn't simply safety first, long life first, all of these things first. And it was important because it had been dealt with quite a few times in the courts in, in, in Britain, but never in the same way in our courts. And again, this is even more so post-ADM commencement, that this is something that's going to be recognised by the courts when difficult cases arise. This is an example from the MCA, where fortunately the judges threw it out. The social workers decided that the couple couldn't go on the Mediterranean cruise because Mrs. Ross, who had dementia, might wander overboard and drown. Well, of course she might, unfortunately. That's always a risk on the Mediterranean cruise, probably more likely for people of your age than for poor Mrs. Ross. Uh, but the, the, no, the, it was thrown out at the court protection who stated they were overstretching it. But you can, I understand the anxiety of staff and they're saying, oh my God, they're going on the cruise. Can I allow them to do so? What if she wanders overboard and drowns? 
will I be criticised as a result for not taking steps? So it's, you know, we're hoping that the correct use, particularly of the guiding principles, will allow the correct decisions and the correct nuance to be made. This is from one of the court protection, and a very different law, by the way, but the principles are the same, which is why they are of some value sometimes. And the same, the whole point, even if somebody lacks capacity, isn't to wrap them in what's sometimes been called forensic cotton wool, and it's not to nursemaid them and it mean they can't experience the whole experiences of life. It's simply to choose the best options with the best of intentions and in good faith is enormous. You're trying to do your best as most healthcare professionals do. So the nuance counts. This is the other case that has caused a lot of consternation. There's no way of escaping it. I'm going to mention it because it's one that has nothing to do with the new legislation. It's simply the ADM has shone a great big spotlight on the whole idea of detention and deprivation of liberty. And this is the AC case. And it was, again, an important finding because we hadn't had a similar case here, although they had occurred in many European jurisdictions and, and in Britain. And the idea that just because you lack decision-making capacity, you don't lose your fundamental human rights, including the right to liberty. And if somebody's going to take it away from you, then it's going to follow a lawful process, and that will mean the courts. It's contrary to what practice had often been and what people would often say, well, that makes no sense. And I appreciate that there are certain types of situations where it may make no sense. But if you think of it as the general principle, that if, if somebody is going to be deprived of liberty for committing a crime, they stand the trial. You don't get the guards just saying, sure, they're guilty as hell. Can't we just lock them up and save the state the expense of all this? So it has to be taken seriously and is being. And it, it certainly is a change in practice in some locations, but there's, there's no escaping it. And the Supreme Court is very clear, the wishes of the person still count. So exactly the same issues that arose in the previous case, that if some vehemently says, I don't want to go, well then, that is something that needs to be taken into account. So the other myth related to ADM, and it's a really important one, is it gives us no powers. And that's where it's different to the MCA in Britain, which does give staff powers, but it gives us none. We can't make anybody do anything as a result. We can't detain them. We can't force anything. The DMR can't make them do things they want to do. The attorney can't make them do things they want to do. So coercion, and I know it's an ugly word, but I use it deliberately for those words, making somebody do what they don't want to do, is still going to be a matter for the High Court and inherent jurisdiction rather than worship. Place of residence, of course, and I just say this, it's not all about capacity. People want to stay there, it's where their memories are. It's where the cat may be or the dog, all of these things that people actually count sometimes as relevant to them as physical safety. It may be emotional safety. How better off? You send people there because they're better off. And I put this in, I deliberately provocative. It's the only slide that ever got me booed at a meeting, uh, at a Nursing Home Ireland meeting about 20 years ago. But, and I can never resist showing a stubborn streak. So how are we going to be better off? Uh, it'd be nice to be other confused people. Mm, not so sure. And we find that people go in, they're bewildered. It's a completely different change. It's a strange environment. If we go in and say that uh, you'll be less confused on admission, well, the contrary is almost certainly true. You're in a bewildering environment, again, away from your routine. So cognitive declines as a court. We're certainly never going to have randomized control trials on these issues, uh, but certainly what's published is consistent with these. So nursing home displacement is associated with accelerated short-term memory loss. You'll be happier. Some people will. We're not a homogenous population. Some people will be less lonely and happier. Many people will be lonelier and unhappier, as indicated by the surge in prescribing of things like antidepressants after people are admitted. You'll get better medical care. I mean, it's been a problem. I don't think it's as bad as it was. Reduced access to chronic care clinics once you go in. So you're in a nursing home. What do you need that for anymore? That has been the case. We've had problems still do to agree with use of antipsychotic medications that were never needed in the community, but now are. And then you live longer is the bottom line. And in fact, almost certainly you don't live longer. Again, no randomized trials, uh, but what incomplete evidence we have suggests the opposite. 
the other myth is we need to identify everybody who lacks capacity so that we can do things, and you don't. You do it only if there's something you can do and something reasonably you can do. And the other one is, I'm worried that if somebody makes a decision and they lack capacity, that I'll be held to blame. People don't have to prove they have capacity. Those who are challenging it have to prove it. So it's the, it's the onus is on the other way around. I don't know if you heard of Mencken, H.L. Mencken was a great journalist, and a lot of aphorisms, and uh, one I like about medicine is that the, not the job of medicine to make man virtuous, but to rescue them from the consequences of their vices. Uh, but the one that's relevant here is his definition of Puritanism. And he said, Puritanism was the fear that someone somewhere is having fun. Uh, and my feel is there's a capacity Puritanism. And it's this fear that someone somewhere is making a decision when they shouldn't be allowed to do so if their capacity was assessed. And we really mustn't get there. This is a true case. Capacity requested predates the legislation, but it was. I agreed to see the person. It's been edited to change the essential information, but the GP was being annoyed, and people were saying, look, this chap who is very overweight, doesn't look after his diabetes, his various organs doing badly, is in the community, and he lives with his son. This Irish diagnosis isn't in DSM-3, not the brightest, but you know what I mean. Uh, no insight into diabetes, and he eats cereal. Crunchy nut. I've changed the cereal for the sake of confidentiality. Uh, and he eats it all day. He demands crunchy nut, and the son brings him crunchy nut. And I attempt to call it a cereal abuser, but... Uh, uh, but it, it was along those that, that he shouldn't look for it, the sun shouldn't bring it, and then there were fears about floods and fires and what had happened, because he really was very bedbound and mobile. And, you know, sort it out. And what was the capacity decision there? It's a decision specific capacity. A decision, about, it is a decision about diet, I guess you could say, where to live, whether to listen to public health nurse. You need some sort of a reason to go questioning some of these. This, this was how he was. He was a lovely chap. I went in to see him in the house, and he was there eating the eponymous cereal <laughs> and watching Judge Judy. And he was as happy as Larry. And we talked. He was very knowledgeable about Galway hurling for a bit. And I said, God, you couldn't. What were you going to do here? Were you actually going to try and get somebody into a home because they wouldn't behave themselves with their diabetes? go to court, an order banning the cereal. You, you know, there was nothing proportionate, reasonable, sensible once you took it in. But then there was great fear that if he was in there and he was bed bound and the house went, if the house went far, he was in real trouble. There's no question, but that, that's, that's the nature of it. Okay, so it is about doing too much sometimes. We can always do things. Uh, it's, this is not to cry the great advances that we've made over the years, but it is to say that we can always go too far, and that goes for treatment, and I, I welcome too much medicine and too many diagnoses and the deep prescribing and all of these. These are part of a... I know Marjorie Warren started with everybody deserves a diagnosis in that context, but it's easy to go beyond. I, was a, I must say I shuddered inwardly at Ronan's great talk, and now we now have pre-AFib. Uh, God, welcome to the gang of pre-things. Uh, now... End of life, though. I knew CPR couldn't save our marriage, but I had to give it a try. We do have problems with excessive use of intervention, and that's where one of the aspects of ADM is going to be having a, a, a advanced healthcare directives for the first time. And we always have to deal with people enough mumbo jumbo. Will I ever play the piano again? Of trying to explain to people the reality sometimes of, of advanced disability and being frank with them, and people generally welcome those discussions. The advanced healthcare directives is at least one route to having plans and having discussions and doing them well. And this is the wrong audience to talk to because in general this audience is very good at having those discussions and encouraging them. But that doesn't mean it occurs everywhere and I think it's, it's for the everybody we need to think about. Some mixed feelings. I, I'm, value of advanced healthcare directives, there are pros. I think the pros are the theoretical one of extending autonomy. You can now speak for yourself when you can no longer speak for yourself, literally, because you've written down in advance what you want. That's, that's one. 
there are failings among us. There's no question about it. Treatments still are given because nobody bothered to have a conversation about it. The other one, I think a practical one that affects us as well, even if you have that discussion in St. James's or wherever, does it transmit out to the community? How do they know that you made the decision that should be respected? Uh, and they often don't. There are the antis, and some of them don't particularly affect us. Sorry, I've gone the wrong direction again. But the antis are that sometimes the person you are now is different to the person you were then. And that particularly goes in somebody with Alzheimer's disease. And of course, we certainly had fears that you get, you're allowed to make one on your 18th birthday, that you'd have a drunken party on your 18th. And like the who in my generation say, hope I die before I get old and it could come back 40 years later when you'd actually quite like to live. Now, I think it's written sufficiently to save us from that happening. Uh, in fairness, when we do them with older people, they have an experience of life and often an experience of the illness that will get them in the end. So I think that's less likely to occur and they have a role. But it's trying to get the right role in there. They are not going to replace ordinary, everyday conversations. They're not mandatory. We can still talk to people on the wards, we can document it. It's a tool, and I think it's a welcome tool overall. It'll help things, but it's not. The danger is people will say, you have to do it this way, or it doesn't count as a DNR order unless you have the Advanced Healthcare Directive. <coughs> Excuse me. So don't do that. This was the first case and it shows you how you can't predict how law is going to go. The first case turned out to be essentially a prisoner using it as a form of blackmail to say, I'm not going to take my medications or eating or drinking, and if I starve to death, that my directive must be respected. We'll see these cases, but I think we'll, we'll see them actually being used in the spirit in which they're attended. Okay, I think it'll be helpful overall if the medical situation is clear, you know what you want, and people can interpret it as written in that way. We respect them, and in the end, they're not a panacea for end of life care. We're talking about the, the whole application of the law. The, the final line is a famous quote from a great judge in Britain. Again, not the same law, but the same principles apply. What good is it making someone safer if it merely makes them miserable? And the whole quote is worth doing, and it's saying the emphasis is on sensible risk appraisal, particularly when we're talking about older people, of taking their views into account, that there are goods to be had sometimes in taking risk. And it's welcome when you see the courts taking these, but we must take the same as well and not have a kind of a risk adverse approach, either to healthcare directives or to assisted decision making. So don't use the risk lens. Roseanne has a great book out, encouraging sex and older people. And I'm delighted to say that, you know, taking a, a, a more expansive approach to life, unfortunately, can backfire. This is about the epidemic of STDs in residential care facilities in the States, which in one way is appalling, in another way is kind of encouraging. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is from uh, Dr. Ezekiel, and Des may remember him, I think we clashed during the would, would we be rationing beds during COVID? He just come across having a great sense of humor, saying that if doctors aren't having the talk, and the talk here is obviously a sex education rather than the talk about death, safe sex counselors may need to get involved in residential care. Now, I'm afraid at the moment, we're still a bit stayed here in Galway, certainly. We have the married Kama Sutra, uh, and the man is loading the dishwasher, and the woman must come over. It's the dishwasher position, so we haven't quite gone the way of uh, residential care facilities. But I hope we will take a more expansive approach to risk and safety as we implement. And thank you for your attention. That's wonderful. Um, we have a question that's come in from the uh, public on, on Zoom. Uh -huh. um, what is the most challenging area of new legislation um, that you've encountered, of this new legislation, in your experience? <laughs> there has been no non-challenging area of the new legislation. <laughs> it, it, it's all been tricky. 
simply because it has complexities. The least challenging has been the principles, because the principles were always there. They're good principles. Yeah. We should have been doing them. But it is getting these new tools and the frustration because of the, it's, it's not pleasant. As Bismarck said, you shouldn't see how law or sausages are made. And look at how law is made here. The frustration bit is you don't get the court rules until the legislation is published. So everything has to follow this order. So rather than being able to plan a lot of stuff in advance, you have to wait until you find out that the courts are going to apply it, and then you have to change it. So it has been challenging trying to deal with the fact that it didn't all come as a neat bundle and then you end up with last minute amendments in legislation and that's as it should be but it hasn't made life any easier. Yes okay yeah. thank you for that. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes Mary Walsh. <clears throat> Thanks so much Sean. Um, should this in any way help us to um, facilitate participation of people with severe cognitive impairment in research in observational studies and um, so that they can be represented for once yeah the good news mary is is that was excluded and uh, i said you get amendments can be frustration but that was one of the amendments that went in uh, and is in the final legislation so there is an option for people uh, to provide powers to others or indeed be taken on so they can participate in legislation now that excludes clinical trials which is in a different box altogether and medical devices uh, but yeah, we have, and we're trying to uh, be involved in the, certainly during the COVID vaccine research and on the National Research Board for the ongoing COVID research, just grappling with some of these as to how we can, because uh, being allowed to participate in research is, is, is a right as well, if it's going to help you and help your condition. So uh, it was a source of lobbying and it was successful in terms of ADM. So the principle is there, we just have to figure out how to implement it. And we'll take one more question from the audience. Hilary, thank you. Hilary, over here, sorry. sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sean, that's great. Um, can I ask with the benefit of hindsight, if you had been allowed to design it any way you wanted to eight years ago, would it look different to what we're dealing with now? Yeah, it, it's funny, I was on, our contributor to the Law Reform Commission uh, which provided a report before this and where we've ended up is nowhere near where the Law Reform Commission was going at the time. Uh, yeah, if you're going back, I, I think it was actually fascinating to see it was made in terms of we the very excellent disability lobbying sector driving for a lot of this. In a way, I, I'd have looked back and said that we, and I mean we in terms of geriatricians and the broader community, and that would include psychiatry, should probably have paid attention at an earlier stage not to the general principles, which I think had to be what they are and are excellent, but in terms of looking at some of the micro detail within there and how it impacts on clinical practice. And it, it's sometimes very hard when it appears in there to un, undo it. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's very hard. The, the lobbying is a full-time business. You really need to know, have your contacts. You need a bit of funding to fund it. And it's worthwhile in terms of influencing how the law emerges. And I think there are lessons, particularly as we engage with the consultation process for assisted dying legislation, for example, that we make sure we very much have a voice at the table. Well, Sean, I think we'll wrap up on that. We couldn't have had a more eloquent and informed presentation on this very important topic. And it's with great pleasure on behalf of everybody mm -hmm. here that we present you with the Willie Berman. <clears throat>